We're all set. I'm Greg Tapo from USA Today. I'm going to be moderating um, this, I guess, second to the last panel. Um, we're going to be talking about Common Core testing. And, you know, I was just reading something, um, I was reading Catherine's coverage the other day, and she linked to something you guys have been, I think, kind of familiar with by now, which is these are protest letters. I will not give the tests. Oh. Um, and this was a teacher from Colorado. I don't know if you guys have, or if you're not familiar with this particular letter and this particular person, you, um, you know the kind of thing this is. This was a, a letter from just this past fall, teacher in um, Aurora, um, Aurora mm -hmm. who said, you know, long, very long letter, um, who said, in part, and I'm just quoting from it, this year, I'm watching an onslaught of Common Core curriculum inf infiltrate our schools, along with additional tests and test prep to add to the test load, which permeates every minute of every school day. And you know, I'm, I mean, I'm older than just about every one of you guys here in this room, but like, I read things like this from last September, and I feel like I went to sleep for 10 years and just woke up. It feels like we are absolutely in the middle of No Child Left Behind again. And nothing feels like it changes. Um, so I'm hoping that we can start from there and figure out, wait a minute, what has changed um, with Common Core? Where are we with these tests um, and where are we going? So we've actually got, I think, two probably the best people in the country to help uh, answer that. So to my right is Catherine Gewertz from Education Week, Scott Martin from CCSSO. Um, you know, the, if, if like a meteor came down and like crushed this table, I think um, most of the common core institutional knowledge I think would be gone. I would, I would be like, I would be kind of a wash, but I think you two guys would, we would not know where to go from here. Um, so um, we're, we're going to start with Catherine, um, and we're going to do just to kind of a very, going to let them give a very quick kind of a 10, 15 minutes, take, I mean, take what, how much time you guys need to kind of lay out um, what you see happening um, as we go into this, well, we're in the school year, as we go into the spring where these tests are really going to start to matter in a big way. Um, so Catherine, I'm going to let you take sure. it away. I just have some slides if I can pick yeah, them out. Yeah, go for it. Um, okay, we just wanted to lay out the landscape of testing a little bit, keeping in mind that, like we've said earlier today, people often conflate standards and tests, as well as conflating standards and curriculum. So it's probably always useful to know what you're asking about or talking about when you uh, ask questions, and good to know what people are talking about when they talk back to you, because sometimes they say Common Core. And we don't really know what they mean unless we ask them, are they talking about standards? Are you talking about what tests you're using? Are you talking about the curriculum? So my piece of it is just to talk about assessment, because mm -hmm. in addition to covering Common Core for the last four years, I've been writing about assessment. So um, I just wanted to give you a brief rundown of the two federally funded assessment consortia, Park and Smarter Balanced, which we've been relentlessly uh, tracking um, membership up and down in uh, so anyway, this is where we stand right now in terms of who, which states belong to the Common Core uh, consortia, the two that are designing tests with federal money. This is which states belong, but that's a different matter than which states are actually using the tests. So when we looked at that, um, we came up with something different. Here's a map that shows at the high point, which is back in 2010, the states that belong to the two consortia. When the money first came out, almost everybody jumped on board. There was some uncertainty, but, um, uh, well, the text is what I want to point out. 45 states plus DC in the very beginning. But my colleague Andrew Uchafusa and I decided to look at, well, who's actually planning to use the tests? Then we got a very different picture. This map here, we, we surveyed all 50 states and DC to find out, okay, maybe you belong to one consortium or the other, but what test are you actually using? And uh, really, far fewer are using the two consortium tests than you would have imagined from looking at the membership map. So if you're trying to find out in your state what the testing situation is, um, you need to go beyond what they belong to and actually ask what their plans are. 
We have a good deal of them here. It's shifting. Um, but 17 states are not planning to use either one of these tests, which means they're making their own, they're buying one off the shelf. Um, and it's probably, you know, if you're interested in figuring out testing in your state, uh, figuring out what they're doing is job one. Here's the, now what, what was that that I had there before? Oh yeah, that was actually, sorry. That's how the consortium membership has shifted. In the beginning, it was 45 states in DC. Now, no sta 17 states don't belong to either one. And 21 belong to Smarter Balanced. I actually updated this for you guys on Friday. <laughs> and 20, 12 plus DC belong to Park. <clears throat> but even fewer are using those tests. This is the map of what states are actually planning to use. You can see that the slate blue, the dark gray blue is Smarter Balanced. 18 states are planning to use that this, this year. The orangey color is PARC, nine states plus DC, although PARC and EDWEEK have slightly different opinions on what planning to use it means. Um, 20 tests, that's the light blue, are planning to use some other kind, 20 states are planning to use some other kind of test that they've already chosen, and three are still undecided. And we have an ongoing debate about what undecided means because in Louisiana, Danielle, um, there's, it's just gotten so complicated there that there are legitimate differences of opinion about whether you think Louisiana has actually made a decision what to do or not. There's still court stuff that we're trying to figure out if really clouds that outcome, but maybe it doesn't. So anyway, um, that, that is just a quick look at the, at the testing landscape and how it's changed. The, um, Oh, Eric wanted me to just offer some story ideas when it comes to testing. And once again, I'm not talking about standards and I'm not talking about curriculum and instruction, although you could until the cows come home. Um, testing. I mean, if you're asking about testing in your state and you want to know maybe what to watch, the first thing is figuring out what test your state is using. Maybe you all are beyond that, so disregard me. But if you don't know what state, what test your state's using, or if you think your readers don't know, your listeners don't know, to me, that's job one. So if, do they belong to a consortium and are they gonna use that test? If they're not, what are they gonna use? And um, some concrete idea of what that means. I mean, if you can get, there's lots and lots of sample items out there and Scott's gonna, I know, share some of those with you, but they're on the Park and Smarter Balance website. Um, if your state is using some other kind of test, the challenge will be to get some of those items and trot them out in front of your readers so that people know what that really looks like and maybe alongside some items from your old test, was that a straight ahead multiple choice test? How does this one look different? Um, time and money, I mean, in my coverage of assessment, time and money have been the biggest issues about uh, commitment to these consortium tests crumbling because they take longer than the tests that most states, not all states, are currently giving, and they tend to cost more than say, a lot of states. When you say take longer, you mean to number give it a hours. day, or? In other words, the number of hours that a student will have to spend taking a test. It's a longer test. Um, and given the environment over test opposition, that has led a number of states to just back out and say, cannot do it, cannot pay more, cannot sell a longer test, sorry. So you might inquire into what, how long your tests are going to take for kids to take, um, for teachers to prepare for, what's that going to cost. Um, the score reports, I mean, there's been a lot of rhetoric about how the bar has been raised and they're going to be harder and the scores are going to drop. So I think that's crucial to keep your eye on. But what's really going to be on those score reports and what is meaningful on there? What are the score reports that your state is designing? Um, how will parents use them? How will teachers use them? What does all that mean? And is it is there some smoke and mirrors there, or is there um, some light in those score reports? Um, also, if if I were you, I would keep my eye on subgroups. And I know that waiver states they have different sorts of plans now, and they may have a super subgroup. But to the extent that your scores are disaggregated. Um, and maybe this is just my bias. I'm always interested in how the kids who need the most are doing. <clears throat> so, and one of the biggest questions with the Common Core was if it is more rigorous, if it is more, you know, we'll get you ready for college. How are kids who need the most support faring in the classroom and on the tests that allegedly measure 
we'll see if they measure, are supposed to measure what's going on in the classroom and are supposed to measure the standards and how well the standards and the curriculum and the tests are aligned. To the extent you can really flesh that out, I think that'd be a huge public service because I think that'll vary a lot state to state and district to district. Um, testing opposition, I think it's true. I mean, there really has been a big upsurge in opposition. Some of it's really flaky and ill-informed. Some of it isn't. I mean, I think it's worth figuring out in your area, your state or district, what exactly is the test opposition made of? Instead of just, you know, listening to what people say and publishing it, I mean, to really find out, okay, so have you read the standards? What part of it don't you like? Is it the way your state is spending money that you don't like? Is it the amount of tests and the number of hours your kids are spending? What are you unhappy about? Find out how legitimate it is. Maybe there's a real public issue there that can be um, uh, reported out and separated from the hysteria that just I don't like to waste my time on. But the trick is, you know, if you have the time to really look into what the ones with the basis are, so um, I think really ferreting out the test opposition could lead to some interesting things. And also, I mean, if parents do opt out in large numbers, if there is a boycott, what effect does that have on the state's ability to find out how kids are doing? Did it have a statistical, did it make a statistical dent in the results? Like, are, is there accountability report in Jeopardy? I don't know. Just things I would probably watch if I were watching a specific state or district. Um, higher ed to me is something to keep your eye on because I know earlier today um, one of the panelists said that maybe the kind of the raison d'etre of the Common Core was um, shared, the ability to share uh, expectations and to share curriculum. Um, but that overlooks one other huge thing that it was about, which is getting everybody ready for college or good jobs. And while the definition of college readiness and career readiness is still a bit fuzzy and um, might vary depending on who you talk to, if higher ed snubs the Common Core, I, to me that's you know something that's really worth watching. Like, are they really embracing these standards for real purposes that matter, not just nodding their heads, but for instance, course placement, if anybody uses them for admission. I mean, that's a recognition that they are being viewed as what they set out to do, proxies for college readiness. So to me, the higher ed angle is worth watching. Um, what are your higher ed institutions going to use these test scores for? Because they agreed in principle, but if they actually make concrete agreements and honor the scores, that's still a question mark. Um, I think watching accountability. Um, what it's, it's great to report the scores, and um, it's very sexy to report the bloodbath. But what are your states using these scores for? Are they basing teacher evaluations on them? Are they basing grade to grade promotion on them? Are they basing high school exit on them? So this is where it really hurts individual people, right? And also at the school level, I mean, now that we have waivers, not everybody's accountability system is the same. But it's worth finding out, based on your state's accountability system, uh, what are they gonna do to a school whose score doesn't reach, whose you know, aggregate scores don't reach a certain point. What, what's the impact, in other words, of these scores? So it's probably good to have your ducks in a row on that by the time the score reports come out. Because who gets hurt and how valid are the measures? So th I think that, that'll open a window into some of the controversy. Um, what's tested versus what's taught? I think I already hit that. If you can figure out a way to experience um, alignment or lack of alignment between the curriculum, the tests, and the standards, then you're in a smarter position to report on what the test scores do or don't mean, right? Because if they come out and you know you've been in a dozen schools in a dozen sectors of your state mm -hmm. and there's really bad alignment, then you're in a position to report that that has something to do th th that that's relevant to interpreting your test scores. Um, oh, I think I already covered use of test scores. Um, oh, there's another tidbit on use of test scores that's probably worth um, keeping an eye on, which is even say your school, a district or a school that you cover is going to um, make sh going to require that kids pass the Parker Smarter Balance test or whatever test they're using to graduate from high school. Are they gonna require that kid to meet the college ready cut point? Park and Smarter Balanced each have 
a point at which if you hit that level, you're deemed college ready. You can, if your higher ed system agrees, you can enroll in higher ed, assuming you get in, and you can skip remedial work and go straight into credit bearing, entry level coursework. That's a pretty high bar. On Park's five level test, that's level four, I, level five, I can't remember. But find out, I'm, I'm, that's four on Park, and it's um, three on Smarter Balance, which is a four level test. So if a student reaches that level, they're deemed college ready. But that's a pretty high mark. Smarter Balance just set its cut points in a process called standard setting. And um, so they set what percentage of kids, if that test were given, based on field test data, are going to hit that, and it's a very small percent. So yeah. if your states and districts are going to require that kids hit the college ready mark to graduate from high school, it's going to be politically very explosive because most kids will not meet that. So, so I, where are I they going to put their cut are, point? I sorry. think it was like 10 or 11 percent. Am I right? I think it's like a little bit higher, but not, not really yeah, I just, I, you'd never know I wrote a story about that a couple of weeks ago. I mean, when, when Smarter Balance wrote, set the cut scores, I had a story, you can look it up on Ed Week, and it, it, it laid out what percentage of kids are projected to meet level four, three, two, and one on the Smarter Balance test. And I think the top level, which is college readiness, was only about 11 or 12%. So, I mean, you can't tell me that graduation rates in your states would manage politically at that, at that point. So the, your states and districts may have to set lower cut points for high school graduation if they're gonna condition it on that than what college readiness is. And to me, that raises the question of, if we're not graduating kids from high school college ready, what are we doing? So, I mean, I just think there's reporting around that, right? Maybe we can't now, because it's too soon politically to do that because there hasn't been enough time and it would be just inhumane to do that to too many kids who, it's not, it's not their fault. Nonetheless, if we're graduating kids from high school at a lower cut point that's short of college ready, that's sort of the whole problem to begin with. So anyway, there's stories in there, I think. I think that's a really good story. <laughs> There's a lot of good stories on that. It's like I mean, the best story. <laughs> well, I mean, college readiness was one of the big, big reasons for yeah. this whole initiative to begin with. And, and you can totally take issue with how are you defining college readiness? Find out. See what people in your state think of that. Like, see what your higher ed thinks of Park and Smarter Balance or whatever test you're using. And there's like a black box around those tests. I mean, I've been living Park and Smarter Balance for four years, but all these new tests that states are using, there's a lot of reporting to be done on those we haven't gotten to. What about ACT Aspire? What about all these other tests that are being used for accountability? How do they define college readiness? And is that legitimate? What does your higher ed think of that? So, um, and some of your states are using tests like SAT and ACT at the high school level for their accountability. Is that valid? Ask measurement ex experts, is that a valid way? To, that's a college admissions test. So there's a whole bunch of good stuff in there to, um, to ask about. The test burden has already been mentioned earlier today, so I don't need to mention it again, but this is a big deal, right? This is rhetoric coming from the White House down to streamline the test burden. So figuring out kind of where that's coming from politically or most of the people arguing about that, trying to preserve these state summative tests, like if they think all the consortia tests and the common core tests are in danger of being rejected, are they clearing the decks to, pre to preserve state tests, getting rid of all the during the year kinds of tests? If so, what's the value of those during the year tests? I mean, they tell teachers stuff. A lot of them are really bad, right? But there's probably really good ones too that yield some information. What are you throwing away and what are you preserving? If you think about um, streamlining your testing burden, how are you going to figure out what you need to know as a teacher and still streamline your burden? Great stories on that testing burden question. And performance assessment, I think, is sort of hiding in the, in the mix there is a good thing to always look at because it's um, both the consortia try to do it. They have performance tasks that are very kind of complicated, lengthy undertakings. Um, but there's even more purist ways of doing assessment that involve performance about portfolio-based assessment. And there's little pockets of the country where that's being done, and that, that might be a nice contrast for you to report on if that's happening in your state or to go somewhere else and report back to your state about places that assess that way and it looks pretty different what's going on um, at home. So I'll shut up in one second, but to me, I mean, if the, the tips would be 
having kind of been navigating this thorny assessment stuff, which is just so frigging complicated. Um, take a testing primer yourself and educate your, um, your readers on what all these terms mean and why should we not snooze through articles about testing. I mean, if you can do major explaining, I think it would really be a public service because this stuff is really easy to fall asleep in unless you get engaged in it and you know why it matters. And then you go, holy shit, yeah, it really does matter. Um, get experts to help you or you will die. I mean, find like really good measurement people at your local universities. And if y'all want to email me, I can send you some names, but better to find them in your state. People who are actually psychometricians, um, really good sources are assessment directors or retirement assessment directors who really know the politics, but they know the measurement. They know, you know, they can talk to you in ways that exclude the hysteria where you can understand what you should keep your eye on. Um, also, testing, you know, the, the big publishing houses that make the tests, if you can find sources in there, get people to hold your hand and walk you through and explain things, it will really help. And I have never had to work so on background as in this beat. People will not talk to you. I mean, people are, they have tons of vested interests. Everybody's sleeping with everyone and his contracts with everyone. Nobody wants to piss anybody off. And the only way you can really understand the issues and what you need to watch and what you need to stay sane about is to let people explain things to you comfortably on background. So anyway, I'll be quiet. You, you mean sleeping in quotation marks, right? Yeah. Okay, we just I, want to make I sure. Would, I would hope people are tweeting away, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm Scott Norton. I work at the Council for Chief State School Officers, um, CCSSO. We are the state chief's organization. I think you probably know that. Uh, also known as the co-sponsor of Common Core. I heard you had a pretty lively discussion about that this morning, according to Twitter. Um, and I've worked there, I lead the standards assessments and accountability group, and I've worked there a little bit more than two years. So before that, um, I was in a state in Louisiana in the State Department of Education for a good long time, more than 10 years. I manage the uh, really the same thing, the standards assessment and accountability program. So a lot of the things that Catherine just talked about, that would have been my job in the state to keep up with that. So I um, have kind of a long history in the SEA. Uh, and way back before that, I was a teacher. I'm gonna just go over a couple of things, kind of the CCSSO perspective, and then I'm a little bit redundant with Catherine, so I'll skip those. I wasn't sure after we talked who was going first and who wasn't. Um, so. You've probably seen a chart like this. Let me just sort of explain what the axes are and kind of what the chart means. But it's really the case for comparability. Um, so the axis across the bottom doesn't actually mean anything. It's just a way of separating out the states. Those are states listed one by one. I know you can't see the, the abbreviations. Uh, the scale that matters is up and down the left side. That's the NAEP scale. So this was based on 2009 NAEP scores and then um, the um, analyst put the state test on the NAEP scale. So there's a couple of things going on there, one of which you've talked about already, I think, which is how far off the state scores are from NAEP. So the bar that Catherine just talked about, kind of that proficiency bar, so most state tests weren't lining up to that. My point is actually not that because I think most of you probably know that and we've already talked about it. My point is kind of the variation between states. So at this time, that's Tennessee way down on the bottom left. So their cut scores, if you will, on their state tests was far, far different from Nate and also far, far different than Massachusetts, which is at the upper right. And Tennessee actually did something about that. They went in a couple of years ago and reset their cut scores to make their tests, their old legacy tests, more rigorous. So this is kind of the case broadly for Common Core or standards like Common Core and more common assessments, that there was this kind of really wide variation across states that there was no really good reason for that. Um, so Catherine talked about this. I'm not going to repeat what she said about park and smarter balance. I will say anecdotally, my last two years in the state were the first two years of park development in Louisiana. We have a little different interpretation of what's going on there, but Louisiana was heavily involved in PARC. Um, so I spent a lot of time in, the, in my last two years in the agency working on PARC. Um, in addition, those 20, we do agree on that number, there's about 20 states that won't administer either PARC or Smarter Balance in, in this school year. So we're working with them and they're working with each other. 
to try to make sure that their tests are at least sort of uh, similar to PARC and Smarter Ballots in some ways. And what does that mean? That a, that a new test, and I think this is kind of the big aha for me, there is, it is true, and Catherine talked about this, that fewer states will administer PARC and Smarter Ballots than were in the consortia a few years ago. That's accurate. So instead of being 45 or so, it'll be about 30. But it's also true that almost every state will administer a new test this year based on college and career ready standards. In my world, that's a huge deal. Um, not that, that I can remember in the, in the years I've worked in education, especially in assessment, has anything close to that happened. So I think it'll be very interesting to follow that over time. So what is a good test? You know, we, we, would, we put out, CCSSO put out some criteria that says good tests are obviously more detailed than this, but aligned with college and career ready standards that are internationally ben benchmarked, address higher order cognitive skills, some of the things Catherine, Catherine talked about, instructionally sensitive, valid, reliable, and fair, meet best practices in test administration, and so So we've kind of put a stake in the ground on behalf of the chiefs about what a good assessment looks like. So I'm going to give you a couple of samples. Sometimes this works okay. Sometimes it's a little awkward. You've probably seen some things like this, and I'll read a little bit just in case you can't see what's up there. So a former or an older test is on the left. Usually recall more basic operations, and I'm no huge critic of the older tests. I've spent most of my career working on those. I think they did serve a good purpose for a long time. It is time to move forward. But usually there was a lot of recall and kind of basic computation. This is from a California released item. It says the total length of the vehicle is 205.83 inches. What's the length of the vehicle rounded to the nearest whole number? The child either can or doesn't know how to round. If they do, they pick C and so forth. So a newer problem would be more complicated, obviously. So this one is, um, I will read you just a little bit of it. Jared is testing how much weight a bag can hold. He plans to put juice bottles into three bags. He wants each bag to have a total weight within the given range. And you can see there's a range if you can't see. So he has to take this little um, three and five eighths pound juice pouch, if there is such a thing, and see how many of those would fit within that range. I actually worked this out last night and you can't fit the first one in. It doesn't work. It goes over because it doesn't, it doesn't match up to the range, but the second one you can fit and so forth. So there's, um, let me show you the other one and then I'll say a couple of points. In this one, the part on the left is the same. This is a sample item. This is five swimmers compete in the 50 meter race. The finish time for each swimmer is shown in the video and there's some, some seconds there. Uh, 23.42 and so forth. And then the question is explain how the results of the race would change if the race used a clock that rounded to the nearest tenth instead of the nearest one hundredth. So basically they have to kind of figure that out. So there's a couple of things going on in these sample items. First of all, the use of technology. I think most people know the new tests will largely be online. The old tests were largely not <coughs> online. Not 100% in either direction, but use of technology. So there's some drag and drop, there's some video, different kinds of technology. Secondly, the skills that the tests are, are trying to assess are going to be more complicated. And we could talk about that more. I'm just going to do one of the English examples and just make a couple of points here. So it's a little harder because you don't have the passage to read, but you, you get the idea. So this is from Park. It's a grade seven sample item. This is below are three claims that one could make based on the article, Earhart's final resting place believed found. Claim one, Earhart and Noonan lived as castaways. Claim two, Earhart and Noonan's plane crashed in the Pacific Ocean. Claim three, people don't really know where Earhart and Noonan died. So part A, or the first question is highlight the claim that's supported by the most relevant and sufficient facts within the passage. Part B, click on two facts within the article that best provide evidence to support the claim. So I didn't show an old one, but a former or older ELA item would not have been that sophisticated. It would have involved some reading and some responding, uh, but this is a little different. And I'll make a couple of points, and this is uh, from the park explanation. First of all, it draws on the student's ability to find evidence in the text. They have to go back to the text, find the evidence to support the claim. 
the text in itself is going to be more complex, most likely, than what they would have had previously. Um, also uses technology in some way. And then finally, there's reasoning skills. So all those claims could be correct, but it's which one does the evidence in the text support? So they can't just pick an answer. They have to really go back and do some analysis. So the English people could do that all day, but I'm going to leave that alone. Catherine talked about the field test a little bit, I think. Did you? Um, so that happened this spring. Field tests happen usually the year before. I'm sorry, last spring. And you know, if you read the stories and you wrote some of them, I'm sure. I think things kind of went better than most people thought. And here's a few examples that you know they interviewed some test coordinators and some students, and it wasn't. Um, no, it wasn't a chaotic thing. Of course, not everything is perfect in any field test or any, any operational test, but largely uh, went better than people thought they would. So I think that was very encouraging to the, to the states and to the consortium. A couple of reactions. This is the first test I've taken where I actually learned something while taking it. A fifth grade student said that test was fun. I don't know who that student <clears throat> is, but you know, I think the experience is probably more engaging for kids is the point. Um, so this is kind of my list of story tips, I think, yeah. similar to what Catherine did. Just make a couple of comments. K keep the first year scores in perspective. Um, they are going to drop, and we'll talk about that, I'm sure, throughout the, the next little bit. But it is the first year. Typically, in any new test, scores drop. If you've covered state testing for a while, you know that. And then they start going back up. In this case, that's almost certain to happen because of the rigor of the test. <laughs> You may want to work with the state that you are in and give a sample test to some folks, some maybe reporters. I've seen it done with politicians. We did that in Louisiana a couple of times. That usually works pretty well. At every state and every, uh, both consortia and every state will have samples and sample tests. I'm sure they can help you do that. Um, ask your state, what do these test scores mean? I would actually do that in advance. They, they may be, your state may be in a consortia. About 30 states will be in a consortia, but undoubtedly, Catherine said this, the context will vary. They're gonna use the test in different ways. Their state policies are gonna be different from state to state. Kind of what is that score going to mean in the state you're covering? Uh, you could, when it comes time for the test, talk with students. You probably would you know, need to, Different states have policies about that. Probably need to work with districts in that case, but I think kids will be honest. They'll tell you really just how it is uh, and, and their experiences. Um, you can cover the release of scores from a family's perspective. I wanna talk about this just for a second. You, If you've done this for a while, and I was sort of in the routine of state assessment results and working with the reporters in Louisiana, and most, Typically, after a number of years, the drill was the scores would come out. We would do some analysis of how they compared to the year before, Louisiana to Louisiana. Some grades and subjects would go up, some would go down. We would make some speculation about why we thought that happened, and the reporter would write a story about that. You don't really have that this year. You don't have an easy comparison of this year's test to last year's test because they're different. You can take a look at that proficiency cut and compare the numbers. You can compare the tests themselves. You can work with the states to understand what's on the test and make that kind of comparison, but that sort of hard number comparison is gonna be difficult. And I, one more thing about that, the state to state to state comparison, which we're interested in, I think will evolve over time. That's not gonna be so easy right at the beginning, so it's probably not what you're gonna be able to do. So one way to contextualize that is maybe to talk with families about, about their experience. Um, where, where I just said that is you can analyze school and district level differences between each other and between the past years to the degree that you're able to do that. And then um, finally, I guess I would encourage you to know and expect there will be some issues. Of course, there are state tests. There were issues on the old ones. Things will happen that aren't supposed to happen. But um, I think the bigger idea is that the tests are better. They're a better measure of the new com uh, college and career ready standards. And um, those problems, if they are um, happening in your state, will tend to work themselves out over time. I think that's it. Great. Thank you both. You know, I, I guess some, the first question I want to ask is kind of a needlessly provocative question, but uh, I want to start with this. You know, if, if, if you were to take everything you guys were, were saying and kind of put it in a paper bag without a label and just start pulling things out, 
you know, so we've got these two consortia, but 15 states don't belong to either one. And these tests um, are being given in a, a bunch of states that have nothing to do with the stuff the consortia is developing. We've got the SAT, we've got ACT Aspire, we've got portfolios, we've got all these things happening at once. And and I guess to me, as sort of somebody who's kind of skeptical about a lot of this stuff, if, if somebody were to take all those facts and then at the end say, and we call it the common core, I think we'd all kind of laugh. And so I guess maybe my first question would be like, what the heck is common about any of this anymore? Um, anyway, let's start with that. And then, and then I want to move on to kind of a second part of this question. I mean, maybe the, maybe the real question is, does it matter if it's common anymore? Um, the, the commonness is important uh, to me. I, I think that it is important, but not so much in all that detail, all what's inside that bag. The, the main thing I think that's important is that almost every state has new college and career ready standards and almost every state has new tests that will measure those standards. How many are in which group and how many are in the other? You know, frankly, I think most people won't care that much about. But I mean, we, we're, we're skeptical about new things, right? I mean, wh how, how does new um, track with, um, I would say, useful, illustrative, um, you know, helpful to, to, to the task at hand? Because yeah. new is kind of a weak word in a way. Yeah, I, I would just think about like the first slide that I showed that mm -hmm. states were, you know, I was in a state, 50 states doing 50 things almost, and that's certainly their right, but it probably didn't yield good outcomes for lots of kids moving from state to state. I think there is an argument for some more commonality at a okay. certain at a certain level. Could I, yeah, yeah. Please. I think there's, I, I always feel like Tevia, you know, on the one hand, on the other hand, it's like, but but I think it's true. I mean, on the one hand, we do have more commonality in the standards. Keep in mind that the slide that I showed you about states using different tests looks much more broken up than the map of who's adopted the Common Core. As Andrew said this morning, we still have more than 40 states on board with the Common Core, the standards, the standards themselves. So there's a whole lot more commonality in standards even with the tweaks and the couple little repeals, there's a lot more commonality in standards than there was. Whether you and folks in your state think that's a good thing or bad thing, plenty of stories to be written about that, but there is more commonality in standards. There's more commonality in tests, but there isn't as much as there is in standards because fewer states. We got all these states using the same standards, but the tests that were designed and paid for by the federal government, designed by the states and paid for by the feds, the consortium tests, far fewer states are testing their standards that way. But I'd be um, stupid not to point out that when Andrew and I did our map of states testing plans, we got ripped up the middle by a couple people who said we were being excessively negative, that we were really not paying attention to how different all the states tests were before and how this is huge progress because after all, even to have 20 something states use the same test, that's progress. So we were being too negative. You could look at it either way. Yeah, it's kind of a good sign when you're somebody says you're being too negative. Um, you know, I, I want to kind of um, ask you about something you said during your presentation, which is, and I, I almost want to kind of take back my first question. I'm not going to take it back, but um, but I mean, you, you know, the, the the one thing that kind of stuck out to me that you said was that for the first time, we've got these tests based on college and career ready standards. So I guess maybe. I mean, would it be maybe more fair to to call this like the college and career ready core? Um, see what I'm see what I'm getting at? Like, for, kind of. forget the forget the rest, forget the sideshow. Let's just focus on the donut. You know, let's let's just focus on you know is is are these kids going to be ready for college and careers? Yeah. So without going into all you know what I do or don't know about the consortia test and old state test I, I think that nobody's convinced by the test right they you, it sort of takes time as you see the tests come out you'll get used to them you'll start to understand the scores better that will not all happen in the first year and I think 
a few years down the line, we, I think, will have some pretty good agreement that the tests are a better measure of college and career ready standards. Um, it, it may take a while and we, we might see a lot of shifting landscape in the meantime. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I answered your question, but I'll no. try again. Is that something you want to address? Yeah. I, I, I'll i split it up a little bit. So <clears throat> take the career part out and put it over here for a minute and let it sit there and we'll get back to it. College readiness. Um, seems to me we should keep our eye on higher ed because I mean you're gonna you're all gonna watch the test test scores get reported from Park and Smarter Balance and all the other tests that purport to measure college readiness, but whether they do, yeah, there's a research agenda that the two consortia have about tracking these kids who take Park and Smarter Balance into college, and there's nothing like finding out how they really did in college and looking back and see, well, how does that correlate with the scores they got on the test? So, you know, don't turn your beat over to somebody else. I mean, stick with it and see how that actually turns out when the research is done. Um, if your state is not using a Parker Smarter Balance test, personally, I would like to know how do, how, where did they create their college ready cut score? What's that based on? Um, and, and how does that relate to the way kids perform having performed at that level and going through college? I, I don't know if we know any of this. And as far as career readiness, it's a mess. There's no agreement on a definition. Tell me I'm wrong. There's no agreement on a definition of what career readiness means because there's too many different career pathways that require too much different stuff. And there's some people that argue that the main thing everyone needs to know, there's a certain core in common. The two consortia have not agreed on what career readiness means or how to test it or how to achieve a cut on it. For, right. for today's purposes about assessment, I'll, I'll go with you on that. Yeah, and Catherine's funny. first point, she said better than I did what I was trying yeah. to say. Um, you're not going to know all that when the scores come out. You're just going to know what the number is. This will take some time. Those kids will have to get to college. There'll be a research agenda. I think over time, if you think about a longstanding test like ACT, whether you love it or don't like it, um, people kind of know what that score means and what it represents. And that'll happen with these other tests, I think. I mean, I mean you know, just speaking of the other tests, you know, the non consortia tests of which we're getting kind of a proliferation here. I mean, does that keep you up at night? The question of whether these tests are going to mean anything? So I mentioned something in, in passing in my slide. CCSSO is put out, I said, a set of principles, actually a series of documents, which are really, I'll say again, stakes in the ground about mm -hmm. what it takes to have a good assessment. We didn't invent that. We worked with the states and with experts to do that. And we're trying to get states to agree to hold each other to those standards. So we are spending, frankly, a lot of time at CCSSO on the 20 states that aren't in a consortia. I feel pretty good about parking smarter balance. I know a bit about them. I think they're going to end up in a good place. Mm -hmm. We'd like to see everybody do something similar. We'll talk about comparability okay. too, if you want to. You know, I have a bunch more questions, but I want to let you guys get some questions in here. Do we have mics floating around, or what, what's the okay? Yeah, and let's. Uh, the, you know, to to me, the important drill is in these sessions is tell us who you are, where you're from, and make it a question. Okay. My name is Justin Murphy from the Democrat and Chronicle in Rochester, New York. And um, the, since so much of the anger about Common Core is actually anger about assessments, I'm wondering, is there something about this set of standards that lends itself to greater prominence and frequency of testing? Th those two things, the testing and the Common Core standards, seem like they're linked so inextricably in maybe a way that wasn't true of past standards. Is there, what's the reason for that, do you think? So, do you guys understand what he's getting I think at? so. You want to try? Well, reframe ahead. the question? Yeah, go ahead. Let me see, uh, Justin, uh, I think I know what you're getting at. Um, what, do, what is he getting at? So, a lot of people don't like tests already, is, is one point he made. And I think you're getting that. Is is there something about these new tests that causes that anger to go up even more? Is that close? What I'm asking is, is there is there something about the Common Core standards that uh, increases the the prominence and and the controversy around the tests? Yeah, I, I'm not sure I know the answer. I, I would say possibly there are 
folks that don't agree with states working together. They want to do their own thing. Um, and that probably has something to do with that. Personally, I think states working together is a good thing. There's a power of resources that you, you can um, that you can bring to bear on, on, a, on the product that states couldn't necessarily do alone. But there are lots of folks who don't agree with that. They think that's a bad thing. It might have something to do with it. I don't, I don't think we have a factual answer to that. I think we have hypotheses. Because, I, I mean, I don't know of any research that's been done about really plumbing. Okay, so you oppose tests, so why? Like, let me pick over. Like, is it the standard? I don't know of any, like, good research on, like, people who oppose tests and really digging into why. One thought I have is that when the, the backlash on the standards themselves was so political, it was about federal overreach. It was about the feds taking over what your children learn. I mean, it got to the point where we heard about things like eyeball tracking technology that's going to be used. With, uh, this kind of stuff, federal overreach, particularly in conservative parts of the country, really hit a nerve. And I think that's what a lot of people heard about. And anything connected to that, be it tests, or a sale at Bloomingdale's, I think was gonna be controversial. So that's one hypothesis, that the standards resonated with all of this federal overreach stuff, so it did create controversy because the tests are connected with the standards. Another hypothesis, I think, to toss around could be that because, I mean, states have introduced new tests for a gazillion years. No one ever hears about it except maybe in that state, but these are common tests that like span the country. Originally, 45 states were gonna be using the same couple of tests. And I think that lent itself to conversation and maybe some news coverage, although there wasn't a ton in the mainstream media about, ooh, these big new tests everyone's gonna be taking. Mm -hmm. Ooh, big new tests. And the people that didn't like testing anyway for whatever reason, be it federal overreach or you're taking too much of my instructional time testing or you're enriching corporate America, mm -hmm. it was one more spark that I think activated people's imaginations and their debates and their conversations about all this testing. Who's doing it? What's it doing? Mm -hmm. Just because they were big tests that suddenly everyone was going to have to take. They seemed big because they were shared. I don't know. Just and then they an said idea. their kid could take the SAT that Saturday, right? <laughs> right. And yeah, um, that, that, I guess that's different. Yeah. Another question? Yeah, uh, this is Amy Scott from Marketplace. On, on a related note, how damaging do you think the opt out movement? could be, given that, as we've discussed all day, people are conflating the standards with the testing. Yeah. Is, it, is, it, is anybody here from Florida? Going once? No? I just, I, the reason I ask is because I was, I just saw, there's a big, there's an opt-out conference or convention next month in Fort Lauderdale. Yeah, I think there's a gathering. Yeah. Do you want to? Opt out? No, no. <laughs> the opt out movement. He'll save his breath. I mean, I, I think that's a really good question. I, 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 you know, I've been told as, as soon as I start asking people questions about opposition to testing, people tell me I'm imagining things. Oh, that's overblown. And typical people, typically people that say that to me are common core advocates, the people who really don't want to deal with this opposition and they think that it's all overblown. It's either a bunch of hysterical parents or, oh, it's made to look like more than it is. I would just suggest you look at it in your states. I mean, is it big in your state? What's happening? What's the impact? If you're more of a national sort of reporter, I mean, right, drop in on where the hot points are, you know, and see see what the impact is. I don't know what I think about could it damage the Common Core. I mean, the Common Core is a pretty damaged brand right now. I mean, you know, we, we, we saw a slide from a study that said that when the question was asked with the Common Core, um, and without the Common Core, you got very different reactions. So it definitely has brand <clears throat> issues, yeah. but whether it'll really take down, I mean, you still have more than 40 states with the standards. Mm -hmm. So it hasn't, it hasn't unraveled that to the extent that it's unraveled the tests. Um, but opt-out, I don't know. I think it really, there's so many questions that go with opt-out. I don't think that's an easy answer because what effect will it have? I don't know, if your kid needs to graduate, that's sort of a big deal if there's an opt-out. I mean, it, what stakes are attached to the test? How's your state using them? I think are pertinent when you ask about opt-out. Um, the whole movement, I don't, I don't really know how to project yeah. that. There's a question up here on the front table. Yeah. Um, hi, I'm a reporter for the Journal News, and my name is Swapna Vinugopal. Um, in New York, there's been a big movement, not a big movement, uh, in Westchester County itself, there have been six districts 
uh, opposed to um, standalone field tests that are administered by PARC. And so school districts are trying to opt out of that. Um, and this year, just last month, the State Board of Regents um, introduced a resolution, and they're going to be voting on it on January 20th, to make it clear that it's actually mandatory, that it's required, and that it's been required since 1938, that field tests have been you know, administered for all these years, and why the sudden opposition. And in fact, they've also said that districts who choose to administer PARC um, don't have to administer the New York State field tests. So that's, you know, so basically saying that it's not an additional test, mm -hmm. it's not excessive testing. Uh, and I, I was wondering if you've heard that in other states where districts are opting out of these standalone field tests, first of all. And these, and just, I mean, just to be clear to people who aren't familiar with that area of the world, I mean, mm -hmm. Westchester is, you know, it's wealthy, um, it's pretty white, right. and it's also these districts are tiny little you know, usually like one high school. Yeah, there are about 128,000 students. And so last year we had about uh, 1,500 opt-outs out of the um, state, not oh. the field test, but the common core aligned okay. state test. So it's a small movement still. Uh, but this field test was interesting to me that, you know, now basically the state is telling um, the districts that if they don't administer these tests, there would be some kind of sanction, you know, once it they vote on it on January 20th, and yeah. it's basically mandatory and they can think of things, you know, that so they you, could do. I and so I was wondering in other states, have you have you heard this, you know, where people are, op the districts are choosing to opt out of the field test because field tests are part of- Just the know, field tests, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, I, you may try that one. Yeah. So just a little bit of background for those who haven't heard those terms. A field test we talked about is the test that's given usually the year prior to make sure the items work well, then the uh, test folks can put the test together. A standalone field test, so, so often a field test will happen as part of a larger testing experience. In Louisiana, we would add a few items to the test. You really couldn't even tell which ones they were. It's not an extra burden. A standalone field test will typically happen for something like a writing exercise. Mm -hmm. We couldn't really add that much more on top. So that's why PARC is trying to get some, some districts to participate in that standalone field test. I do know it's very state specific. Um, I don't have a lot of good examples, but some states require that their districts participate in the field tests. Some states let the districts decide. So I think you know if you ask around, you're going to get different different points up on that. Mm -hmm. I, I guess one point I would like to make. This is sort of my old hat from Louisiana. I never quite got that. Like if I were in a district, I would have wanted to be in the field test. You get to look at the stuff before anybody else. You get to try it out with no stakes attached. What, what could be better than that, right? Yeah. So it, it, there are some positives to field tests. Plus, it makes the test a better test in the end. You're actually contributing something. Yeah, that's like when my, my computer crashes, I want to tell Apple, you know, please make things better. I mean. The bug report. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, um, I, I think your, your point is well taken, which is that you do get sort of a head start, right? You do. I mean, you get a peek at the test without exactly. Yeah. You, you literally do. I'm actually going to throw that. Right. So just yeah. That, um, the when I did the story, when I spoke to them and I asked them, you know, why is it that they don't like these field tests? Because they only, uh, you know, it's only over a 40 minute period. You know, it's just one single test. Yeah. It's not like a whole day. I mean, that's what a lot of parents seem to think it's like. You know, hours and hours of testing and. One, this was interesting because they said two things. One is they're enriching, you know, why should we enrich Pearson? That was mm -hmm. one thing. The second thing was uh, we don't learn anything from the tests. Meaning, yeah, we get to see the tests, but we don't know how the kids have performed and it just goes into a black box oh, and see. that's it. And just we don't learn. Sky, exactly. Yeah. And, and yeah. from the state, I mean, with the tests that we administer, the teachers have a lot of learning from that to do, yeah. you know. In this case, we have no clue what's going on. Yeah, so that was yeah that, that's largely true. You, you don't typically get data back from a field test. And one other thing I forgot to say about your earlier point, I think states are smart when they give districts a choice. So if you're in this field test, you don't have to do this other thing. We would do some of that in my state. If you do this, you don't have to do that. So it doesn't make such a burden. I'm going to actually throw that question out to you guys. Has anybody covered something like this where, where districts, schools, even maybe even teachers, um, you know, opting out of the field test? Or is this West just, you know? And tell me where you're, where you're reporting from again. Rochester, New York. Okay, just a very different part of the state. Westchester, I, I grew up in Westchester. It is not upstate, by the way, in Port Chester. 
Anybody else? Did you? Yeah. Were, were you going to ask a question or are you going to talk about opting out? Uh, Let, let's make sure we have no more opting out. Anybody? Nobody? OK, now you can ask your question. And we have time for like one more question, so you might be the last. Perfect. I'm Danielle Dreilinger. I'm with uh, Times Picayune. Yeah, uh, sorry. sorry, we can go to the questions. OK, so we have time for two questions. Yeah. Sorry, well, Danielle. I'm with the Times Picayune in New Orleans. So you guys are making it sound like we should just give up on this idea of the cross-state comparisons um, because so many states are using their own test. I was going to ask a bunch of Louisiana, I have a bunch of Louisiana specific questions about, you know, paper and pencil version of PARC versus the computer version of PARC. But yeah, I mean, is there going to be any effort to make these scores mean something in some greater context tied to NAEP, tied to ACT, tied to each other states? Because this, I was talking with Mike McShane this morning, this is one of the selling points for Common Core for, say, the military in particular. They love the idea that kids can, families can be moved around the country mm. and have the same, you know, be learning the same things. And then states like Louisiana are saying, well, if we'll finally know, not just with NAEP scores, how we're doing <clears throat> against the rest of the country. But yeah, so it's, but is this something we should just sort of shrug and say, well, not going to happen? It's a great question. I'll start. Um, we at CCSSO, me anyway, are, are really interested in comparability. That we're doing some background work. We're not quite there yet. We have a research design that we are putting together. We've done some work that I won't go into right now of how to compare scores across Park, Smarter, and other states. And you said, Nate, there will be some way to do that, I think, over time. That won't happen right. immediately. What could happen pretty quick, though, is Park states compared to Park states and Smarter Balance states compared to Smarter Balance states. And at least that's a start. I'll add a slightly grumpier perspective, which is that um, sources and measurement and evaluation people, psychometricians who know way more than I could imagine knowing about these topics, have given me often kind of a hairy eyeball uh, answer to those questions. I mean, uh, a number of folks that I've talked to for the whole time I've been on this beat are less optimistic now that, that they will get any comparability than they were in the beginning. The the park to park state and smarter balance to smarter balance state, that doesn't seem to be an issue. I haven't heard from anyone that there's a comparability problem within each consortium. Yeah. But the two consortia said in the beginning, we want to find a way to make all of the scores comparable, whether you're a park state or smarter balance state. And measurement people I know say that they think that's seriously in question. Yeah. And of course, now that you have so many tests being used, I think Andrew and I reported 19 tests yeah. are now in play for this school year instead of two. Um, and people in the field that I've talked to don't see how there could be comparability um, from state to state on those kind of different tests. So, I mean, find measurement people that will tell you. I mean, are, is there, are there linking and scaling things that could be done between these? I mean, maybe there's like smart people who are working on that that can tell you. Carolyn, did you? I just, did you want to just a very quick thing, and I apologize if I missed this. So year one, i.e. this year, 2015, is it going to be it, valid to compare SBAC states and park states um, to each other first year one? I think what we're saying is it's valid to compare within the consortia. There doesn't seem to be, as far as I know, a question about that. Across consortia right. will be so, more difficult. So we should expect a lot of um, coverage that does that, yeah, when the, when the results come out, do you think? Yeah, yes, yes and no. What what hasn't been talked about yet is that the timing probably won't be exact. Like there's states, just take Smarter Balance states, for example, they're under no obligation to do that at the same time. So each Smarter Balance state has their own reporting contract. So it's not like they'll just be a page where it pops up. It, it may take a little while to figure it out. But statistically, I think the data will be there. I think we, I think we missed the boat here. We should be, speaking of college, we should be having like, you know, like all the states in the Big Ten, you know, like they take the same like test, that. and then like you compare and we can compare these the different regions. Five, right? yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, you got a question up here. We have, so we have like just a couple minutes. So if you can make a, like a really quick question. Sure, um, David DeRoche. I'm a, currently a freelancer, um, which basically means I wake up late and pretend to work. Um, 
No, my question is has to do with um, the achievement gap, which um, if we're talking about comparing states that are taking the park, is there some kind of uh, examination within these assessments or some kind of process within the school districts that deliver them to either have these tests that are tailored more to like, if you have districts that are very culturally diverse, are they taking the exact same tests? Are they learning the exact same content? to that test that other school districts that are might not be as diverse. So within example, a state. Within a state. Yeah. Or is there is it just a flat test or are there tests that uh, cater toward English language learners? Like how mm -hmm. how are how are these tests changed in turn to determine like where the okay. geographically are given? That's a good question. That's a big topic. Um, yeah. It's probably its own session, but Yeah, it, there's a lot there. I, I all I can say is the the state folks that I know are working hard on that. They're we, for example, host an English language learners assessment advisory task force. We host a special ed assessment advisory task force on behalf of the states to dig into issues like that. And we can talk more about it if you want. I'm gonna let Emily in the back. Did you have a question? Oh, Last question? Yeah. And, and I'm sure these guys will stick around for a few minutes. So if you have any more questions. Okay. Emily is selflessly giving up the mic. Sorry, go ahead. I just wondered if you could Your talk. Name? Sorry, Elizabeth Harrison from Rhode Island Public Radio. Okay. I, I wondered if you could talk for just a couple minutes about cheating and, um, uh. you know, like new ways of cheating now with these online <laughs> tests, what you're doing to try to protect against tax and things like that. Um, can, can, can I, um, if you have like a 20 word answer, that'd be great, but um, it's 409. We're supposed to quit at 410. So take a minute. Um, the, it's hard. Like I spent a lot of time on test irregularities when I worked in the state, and it will continue to be hard. The thing that makes it harder is the items are exposed across a greater number of students. The test windows, which are typically tightly controlled by a state, get spread out, so the items are out there for longer periods of time. I think being online is an advantage. You know, you can't copy you can't it. Take and the test home. Do that kind of thing. So they're working on that. I don't know the state of the art, but. So are we going to say different kinds of cheating stories or no more cheating? Like what's? I don't tweet it, right? I don't think cheating is going to go away, right? As long as there are tests, there'll be some kind of cheating. But states work on that very hard. They spend a lot of time on that. So I'm sure they will continue to do that. Yeah, I wish we could spend more time on this. But did you just want to say something, Michael? Because there's not going to be any more erasing, right? Not erasure analysis. I don't. I'm not up on that. I, I know. Well, remember there are paper things. and pencil versions being given this year. There are. Right. Kind of over their shoulder, or the kid who's on the monitor. You know. In terms of stories for reporters, which you know, I know that's why you're here. I I think that's something you could talk to the states about. What are you doing? What's your plan? Have you modified your test uh, security policy mm -hmm. as a state? You know, they should be proactive about that. And I think, you know, to Catherine's point about psychometricians, I mean, it seems to me that a psychometrician, you know, these are the things they, that keep them up at night. You know, how, how is somebody going to cheat on this test? Right? Well, right. I also guess that your states are going to have to watch for things that would be flagged. I mean, when they score these things, they're going to, there's got to be somebody who's watching for irregularities. And if there's a district, no? then maybe you're going to be working a lot. Sounds like a great story. We got to go, but thank you very much. And, and you can ask these guys questions later.